Oh, you're gonna wanna see this. I've been excited about this box for, I can't tell you how long. Uh, Tyann is supporting me in my mad science. There's a server in here. Well, that's not actually technically accurate, a uh, server. What sort of madness is this? It's exciting, it's, a, it's epic. Quad damage. Quad damage and not from FedEx. When something like this happens, you know the video is gonna go off the rails, as in rack rails. We're gonna need these later when we put this in the rack. The good kind of rack, not the 17th century torture device. Although it is kind of a modern torture device, I suppose. Oh, it's a 2U server, right? Not exactly. Let's, uh, let's get this on the bench and then take a closer look. 94 pounds. Now remember when I said it was a little misleading that this was a server? It's four servers. And that's what makes this server so appealing. And you know, I, I'm kind of treating this kind of special, but it's really, it's not. It's four separate servers in one chassis. They each have their own management interface. They each have their own LAN. You can do maintenance on them completely independently. So it's pretty awesome, really. This lovely, lovely machine is the Tyan Transport CX TN73B8037. So there's a couple of different motherboard modules that Tyan has for this, but uh, yeah, we've got the quad NVMe, you know, ultra tie-in quad damage is what I'm gonna refer to this as because four epic sockets. There are of course left and right halves, but the genius of Tyan's design is that they share a common motherboard. It's just the physical placement of the power distribution board that varies. In the left-handed variety, it's a very short cable from the power distribution board but in the right-handed variety, it's a much longer cord that loops around to the other side. It's pretty clever. It's a pretty efficient use of space as well. Now there's some really important considerations when you're looking at a chassis like this. It's four sockets in a 2U system. I mean, obviously Epic has 128 PCIe lanes. You're not gonna get that in this chassis. I mean, there's just not physically room. Also at the front of the chassis, you've got power, reset, and ID buttons, two full-size USB 3.0 ports. At the rear, you've got VGA and USB Type-C, so that you've got a little bit more flexibility because, well, there wasn't enough room for a Type-A port back here. I mean, come on, let's, let's face it. But it does have two onboard 10 gig NICs as well as dedicated IPMI. For all intents and purposes, each module in this 2U server is a physically separate server. There's no proprietary interconnect or anything really to go wrong with the chassis as a whole other than possibly something to do with the power supplies, but those are redundant as well. So for something like a VMware cluster, this is pretty much the perfect box. You need to have three nodes to have a true VMware cluster, but then if one goes down, you've only got two. Four nodes in a 2U box, this is pretty much the densest thing that you could have for something like a VMware cluster. For web servers, database servers, anything where you need a tremendous amount of density, this is pretty much the way that the future is going. This is also a way to do it in a cost-optimized kind of a way. <laughs> this is the actual server. And there are four of them in this chassis. How bananas is that? We've got full eight channel memory, 64 core support, like I said, four NVMe in the front, and we've got room enough here at the back for two half height expansion slots, as well as an OCP3 slot. We have dual onboard M.2, one located here, one located back here. But the M.2s are gen four. So everything is gen four, basically across the board. The risers, the mezzanine, everything. So that's M.2s, we go to the OCP mezzanine, look, Gen 4, riser, Gen 4, riser, Gen 4. We also have onboard RS-232, in case you need serial or debugging or something like that. I'll mention real quick that these motherboards also have an onboard micro SD card slot. Again, perfect for any kind of hypervisor or you know permanent operating system storage that you might need in each chassis. Onboard micro SD storage, so it's got VMware basically written all over it. It's pretty awesome. The OCP3 slots mean you can deploy, you know, 25, 50, 100 gigabit ethernet without taking up any of those valuable X16 slots on the other side. Those are half height, half length. So if you need local flash caching, you can do it. Four servers in a 2U chassis. Tyan has really done it. You can pack 
256 cores in this chassis and uh, four terabytes of memory. Maybe more when we get higher density VIMs. I'm just saying right now I can buy a terabyte of memory per socket and it's fine. Should be able to buy two terabytes of memory per socket in the not too distant future. If you need any really technical information, maybe you need a, a layout diagram for the motherboard or you need to know if that extra special 100 millimeter, you know, M.2 with the built-in heatsink is gonna fit. Well, fortunately, Tyann has really good mechanical drawings and other information in their manual. Like for example, if you're not gonna populate all four memory slots, what configurations are supported? Well, I only wanna run one or two dims. That's not recommended for Epic. You can run four, you can run six, you can run eight, but this chassis recommends running four and eight configurations. So keep that in mind as you're you know, planning your build and, and working on it. So this looks really exciting and it's a lot of fun and I love doing this because it's kind of like Lego with servers. Now, one of the things you might not realize is Tyann sells this as what's called a bare bones kit. Bare bones kits like this are not a Tyann specific thing. That's a, that's a common thing you can ask for. It's like, hey, give me the, the bare bones kit. What do I need for the bare bones kit? It makes it to where it's pretty easy for, you know, even lowly software programmers to put together their own server. So in this box, you know, we get the chassis. We also get the heat sinks. So here, you know, it's like the copper cold plate, high density, pre-installed thermal paste. You know, everything that you need to start using this chassis, assuming that you get, you know, a retail package Epic CPU, which may come on a tray like this. You also have the mounting rails, which I was really excited for. And basically everything that you need to get up and running with the server except for storage. So 2000 watt power supplies in this 220 volts AC. For a four socket server, this is completely Lilliputian. When you look closer at the label, you'll actually see that if you provide the server with only 110 volts of input, each power supply is only 1000 watts. But if you give it 220, then each power supply is 1800 watts. Close enough to 2000, we'll call it even. This chassis, with the insane density that it has, still supports up to 240 watt TDP. So you can see TDP, those P processors, all the way up to 240 watts and still be able to run four of them in this chassis, no problem. That's a thousand watts of processors just by itself. As configured, this chassis will support both Rome and Milan CPUs. That's Epic second and third gen. So depending on what your needs are, the chassis is gonna be able to support both of those generations of CPU. So we're basically ready to do our first build. The CPUs that I've selected for this, Epic 7443, 24 core monster CPUs. Yeah, have you noticed that AMD Epic pricing, you know, if you go for the 64 core CPU, there's a P variant of that CPU that's a lot cheaper. What's the difference between the Epic CPU and the Epic CPU with the P? Usually the P CPUs are clocked a little slower, they're a little less expensive, but the main thing is that they only work in single socket servers. Well, this is four single socket servers in a 2U chassis. That 24 core CPU that's elite dollars, 1337, in something like this, it's pretty much the ultimate mid-level VMware cluster because with VMware, you might need high-speed networking or maybe you've got an old school fiber channel interface. You've got the PCI Express connectivity for what you need for that, but really it's uh, more of a memory and CPU bound type situation. You can use those P series CPUs in these kinds of systems, save a bunch of money on cost and still have a really dense installation or you only take up two U of rack space as opposed to eight. It's pretty awesome for those high density installations. Of course, you can still run a 7713, that's 64 core. That's really low power. That actually comes in under our uh, TDP power budget here. Uh, there are other CPUs, like if you had a, uh, you know, Rome or you were upgrading from Rome or you could get a deal on some Rome CPUs and depending on what your application is, uh, something like the 7742 would also not be a bad choice because that's 240 watts TDP as well. And most data centers are gonna have you know, 220 volts available for these systems because 110 volts is just not as efficient. And sometimes you run into licensing considerations. You know, 16 cores is kind of the, the spot where software vendors are getting a little nervous about how much density you're packing in here. So even throwing something in here like the 72F3, that's an eight core CPU, eight, 16, 32 cores in total in the chassis can make sense from a software licensing standpoint. If you look at the cost of say, Microsoft SQL Server, those frequency optimized eight and 16 core parts from AMD are really gonna be the sweet spot. And the cost difference for going for the frequency optimized version of the part versus say the P series version of the part from AMD, uh, yeah, it's gonna cost more for the F series CPU versus the P series CPU, 
but the licensing cost of the software itself is so much more insane than the cost difference for the processor that you should get the most processor that you can possibly get within a core limitation. Similarly, if you run something like Kubernetes or Ansible, uh, Equinix Metal has Tinkerbell for managing, you know, you basically can boot from the network and enroll machines. So if you treat your servers like cattle and not like pets, you can integrate something like this really quickly and efficiently with your infrastructure. You don't really need to roll out something a lot more complicated than this unless you really need a lot of PCI Express connectivity, in which case it's gonna physically take up a lot more room anyway. Uh, for something like, you know, Kubernetes and Kubernetes clustering and the failover and redundancy and all of the stuff that goes with that, this is pretty much the perfect solution because those things are CPU and memory bound type problems. So yeah, I can deploy, you know, two, four terabytes in this thing pretty much immediately and be able to run the whole Kubernetes enchilada off of this and still have really great redundancy because I have four physically separate servers. Now I really don't have to tell you how insane it is that Tyann was able to pack all of this in. I mean, look at it, it's so tiny, it's so cute. This is basically the ITX system <laughs> of the server world. I mean, this is just, this is exciting. This is really, really exciting is what this is because you know, the low cost option is those P series processors in a chassis like this. And it's a tremendous amount of horsepower. Like I say, up to 256 cores in this 2U chassis. But I think my recommendation would probably be for the uh, high frequency 16 core CPUs or, you know, the more middle of the road 32 core CPUs, because not every workload is going to take advantage of 64 cores. And if you are doing, you know, high performance computing, academic research, you know, material scientist fluid simulation stuff, you probably want to go ahead and get a bigger chassis unless you are space constrained for more room because you never know what you'll need to add to the system. Maybe you'll need to add an FPGA or some other type of proprietary add-in accelerator or a lot of GPUs. And you can do some acceleration with two half height, half length slots, but it's a little bit more constraining um, than you would otherwise have. So unless you have density needs, you know, go for something bigger. But if you do have density needs, or you just like the idea of something like a VMware cluster or a Kubernetes cluster self-contained in a 2U chassis and scaling that up, you know, for rack scale, then this is the chassis for you. Now, in terms of content for level one, I've got some cool stuff coming up for this. We're gonna take a look at some open source things, but if you use stuff at work or you wanna see a project with a cluster, let me know. I kinda wanted to take a look at Tinkerbell and show you how to use Tinkerbell from, from Equinix Metal on something like this. But I also wanna show you like a VMware cluster. And a VMware cluster will use local storage. Sure, that's vSAN. Uh, or at least you've got the option of vSAN. But we also are gonna need iSCSI storage to do it right. And so we're gonna need another piece of rack gear for that. And that is gonna have to be for a future video. So again, big thanks to Tyann for sending over the Tyann Transport CX for me to take a look at. If you're looking at doing deployments like this or the chassis is intriguing the density is intriguing let me know in the comments below let me know about you know what how could this fit in the enterprise you know where you work or how do you see this being used or do you see any downsides other than you know lack of pcie connectivity it's all about the density it's like it's all about the density like it's all about the, the pentiums is that is that sort of where we where we ended up where we are yeah i think it is so yeah, engagement challenge. Let me know how you would use this at your workplace or uh, you know, how you might deploy it. You know, Kubernetes, Podman. Podman is a thing, kind of replacing Docker. That's gonna be another, another video where we take a look at that and work with that on this because this is a crazy amount of horsepower in such a small package, my goodness. Well, I can't wait to test all of that fully in that upcoming content, so uh, be sure and check that out. I'm Wendell, this is Level 1, I'm signing out. You can find me at the Level 1 forums if you'd uh, like to get a conversation going there about what you'd love to see running on this, let me know. All right, I'm signing out, and I'll see you there.